Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of the Tuesday Night Podcast. Whether or not you are listening to it on Tuesday night is up to you. <laughs> My name is SBJ or Steve or whatever you want to call me. Uh, Super Below J. <laughs> right off the bat. And uh, we have Alan here today. Hey, that's me. And uh, we have your partner in crime, Sean. Hey, I'm Sean. Uh... <laughs> I should start by apologizing that we didn't really do a good job of actually saying who we are uh, in episode one. I Maybe if you've listened to our pilot, you could have got a better better thought, but... Don't worry, I blame Sean. <laughs> yeah, I blame, I blame Sean too. for not being there. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is SBJ, which is short for Steve Black Jr., uh, but I'm the host and creator of a Pokemon podcast called It's Super Effective, and I met both Sean and Alan at Gen Con for several years, and then we decided to do this podcast together. And uh, that is where I stand in this mix of three, this threesome that we have going. Wow. Menage three, I believe they call it. I'm Alan Girding, and I'm one half of the duo that is Tuesday Night Games, the other half being my business partner, Sean McCoy, partner in crime, amongst other things. But... Yeah, I designed games, designed a bunch of games, most of them unpublished, did a whole bunch of play testing. My name's in the back of a lot of rule books. And our only game out officially right now that is for retail is Two Rooms and a Boom. I'm Sean. I'm the other half of Tuesday Night Games with Alan. Um, I handle mostly uh, the sort of business side, like the manufacturing and the shipping and that kind of stuff of Tuesday night games. And, uh, in my sort of normal life, I'm a freelance graphic designer. So sometimes I do some graphic design work for Tuesday night games as well. Don't sell yourself short. He's an amazing artist, Yeah, <laughs> but apparently SBJ is as well. Yeah. Look at this. We're going to have like a clash of graphic design. We should have some type of competition. Mm, I would probably lose. What? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh cool so this is a podcast about board gaming and uh about us i guess we started off with we're, we're, yeah we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff yeah sorry don't let me interrupt no no that's fine uh that's cool. that's fine. go for it there You're probably fine. will be a lot of this because we're because we're all not sitting in the same room secretly that brings us to our first segment what are we actually wearing no not really sorry <laughs> go on. uh yeah well last time we started off with what we were playing and uh oh, no. let's do that again uh what board games we've been playing if anyone wants to go first john have you played anything since last week I haven't played anything since last week this week was a big uh like retailer week and sort of researching games that I wanted to buy for my group because my group is very particular. Um, and so I've just been looking through a list of like what I think may or may not play well with them. Um, but I didn't get to play anything this week now. Two main things that I've played this week. And one of them is a little Kickstarter. I'm addicted to Kickstarter. I should say that off the bat. I have a lot of Kickstart games. Uh, but one of the games came in recently, and it's called Moral Dilemma. And it's basically the same game as Billionaire Banshee, which is another Kickstarter, which is similar to a lot of other games. Basically, Moral Dilemma is you pull a card, and it gives the reader two options. It will say, like, you have to either put your dog in a pit of lava or your wife in a pit of lava. You can't choose them both. And then it's cool because they have this random C deck. So there's option C, which is totally random. So a lot of times it has nothing to do with option A or B. Like one of the option C's was just do neither A or B and just masturbate furiously. So it's slightly inappropriate. And it's actually funny because the cards are rated slightly inappropriate, inappropriate, and severely inappropriate. It has like this green, yellow, red standard. But anyways, you're supposed to predict what the reader would choose. Uh, and that was one game, and that's just cool because it was very conversational, very laid back. You don't really keep score. Uh, but the other game 
and this is kind of blending into business talk here, I'm kind of nervous to even talk about it, <laughs> is we play tested Dinner of Doom, which is like two rooms in a boom, but one room, specifically it's not even a room, it's at a table, so it's like the tabletop version of two rooms in a boom. And I was really nervous to play it because there are some critical people in the group that with whom I was playing. And so a lot of times I'm scared to show anything new to people that are hypercritical. I've played so many new games with my group that when I pull something out, a lot of times I feel the reaction is, oh, geez, here we go again. But it went over really well. Can, really I, can well. I stop you real quick? Please. So it seems like your audience was hesitant to play a new board game, whereas I feel like from what you've explained to me, your gaming group is super into games, if I'm not mistaken. Depends on which group you're talking about. Uh, my Tuesday night group is a mosh, a motley crew of different people, but mostly I'd like to think it's about friendship. It's funny because we have a couple people that go that hate games, which is really sometimes frustrating but other people that are really into games. I've had one person leave angry because like, we didn't play enough games. So it's it's pretty eclectic. We have a lot of different characters. Because it's not a dedicated board gaming night. It has a lot of board gaming night, but it's kind of evolved over the years, right? So I think yeah, that's part of it. It started as Halo night way back in the day when Halo <laughs> 1 came out. And I had four TVs and four Xboxes, and they're all linked up together and then it evolved into basically like sports night once it got really nice out and slowly i got into more and more geekery and it became tuesday night games okay so is was this the group that was this your tuesday night group that you brought this new game out to yes it was and i don't think it's so much that they're opposed to games where they what they were thinking oh geez here we go again as much as they're opposed to my games and I think this is a very important note for would-be designers and our designers out there. You have to be careful you don't burn out your play testers. So I've learned that I only bring a game out once I've really hashed out a lot of details on it, at least to my Tuesday night group, because I don't want to get my dick knocked into the dirt for just some kind of basic idea that I'm floating around. It better be pretty hashed out. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... Because it, it, it's stressful playtesting something that's, like, not fully finished. You know what I mean? It's like seeing your kid in a play or something. Like, you don't want them to mess up. Um, but you don't know if it'll be fun or not, right? Because you've never played it before. And so I could see how there'd be, like, stress on both sides of the table. For our listeners, so how much did you play prior to bringing it out to your Tuesday night game group? I played a ton in my mind. <laughs> Yeah, so I really hash out all the details. It's crazy because I have this fear of my play group. Really, this is really therapeutic. Thanks, SPJ. I'm, I'm getting this. <laughs> I haven't really talked about this. It's really scary, especially for my group, because they're the only ones. I shouldn't say they're the only ones. They're the ones I care the most about because of the game sucks. I'm going to have a really hard time playing it. And the harsh thing is sometimes the games are great, but one sandbagger ruins it for the whole group, and then they don't want to play it. You pull it out and like, hey, let's play this game. Ugh. It's, so it's, it's one of those things where I don't want to poison the well, if you will, early on. So I have to make sure they have as good of an experience as, at first as possible. And how did it go? It went fantastic. It was really surprising. All of them basically said, yeah, this is... Like a different version of Two Rooms and a Boom. You definitely can't claim that it's nothing to do with Two Rooms and a Boom because it reeks of Two Rooms and a Boom. But the cool thing is we played with just six players, seven players, eight players. And some people complain about Two Rooms and a Boom once it has fewer than 11 players. Uh, sometimes people say any fewer than 12 and I won't even play. But here this game plays from 6 to 14 and it's really sweet at six players. So... And you don't have to walk around into different rooms and you're all talking to each other at the same time. So it, it has that more tighter niche feeling to it. Hmm. That sounds cool. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, is it, I don't want to compare it to another game, but like, so in my mind, I, I am thinking it's, it's similar to Two Rooms and a Boom, which is kind of similar to Werewolf, which is kind of similar to The Resistance. They all kind of fall into that hidden role game. This podcast is over. <laughs> and <laughs> not that any of those games are bad. 
No, I'm just teasing. But like when I think of sitting down at a table that's kind of like two rooms in a boom, I think of the resistance. Oh, well, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode. Uh, the big difference is it's more about finding your teammates than it is about finding your enemies. So you get a cooperative game feel. You're building your team up rather than lying and manipulating. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's bonus if you can find the primary character of the opposite team, but it's much more about getting together with your teammates, finding people you can trust, and going for it. In the earliest place, the crazy thing about this, too, is Dinner of Doom, three-minute game. Three minutes. So, uh, crazy. So uh, that was other one thing. If you add in time between rounds for the transition, it's more like five minutes. And I'm not sure if I'll have to change that because people definitely said, wow, that was really quick and fanatic. But yeah, we'll see. Something I'm working on. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. It's exciting. Uh, well, I didn't play uh, anything this week, but I got a huge shipment of games just uh, from old Gen Con stuff or Kickstarters that came in. Nice like checking behind me without trying to make my voice go down. I got the, we could just edit it out. Yeah, that's true. I, I got the catacombs Kickstarter, the reprint of that. Yeah, that's awesome. That has that great artist. What's his name? Sean, do you know offhand? Sorry to put you on the spot. Catacombs artist. He's the guy that does the really kind of flat but cartoony art. It almost looks like they're cardboard cutouts, but they're not. Oh, crazy. He gave us a business card. It's in the back. Oh, oh, what's his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's his name? What's his Anyways. name? Anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that, that I, I remember the shut up and sit down review of that. Quan Chai, Quan Chai. Yeah, that's it. Good work, Sean. <laughs> Anyways, this is the flick flicking game. The flicking game, yeah. And I was like, man, I really want that game, but that game has terrible, terrible art. And so when they reprinted it on Kickstarter, I was like, for sure, like this Kickstarter will definitely work because they've made the game. They're just changing the art. Uh, and then they shipped like two years late, but I got it finally. Nice. Um, and then I got the. Machi Koro Deluxe Edition, which I'm a big fan of Machi Koro. I hear I hear a lot of people say the box is way too big for the components. The original, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the Deluxe Edition comes in a really nice, um, it's a smaller box, but it's a tin box, which is sweet because I like tin boxes to take to, to take outside the house because they don't get beat up like typical cardboard boxes do. Interesting. Then, You're the first person I've ever met who likes the tin boxes. Really? Seconded. Yeah, most mm -hmm. people I talk to say, uh, give me death before you give me tin. Oh, man. It's so nice to throw like a bunch of tins in a duffel bag and not having to worry about your like your corners getting all scuffed when you get home. That's a great point. I mean, I mean, if it's just sitting on my shelf, cardboard for sure, because it's... Yeah, I think that's the complaint is storage. They don't stack on top of each other well. And when you open them, sometimes they stick. So cards go flying everywhere when mm -hmm. you open them and they're loud. You can't, it's hard to steal them from someone's game supply. <laughs> yeah. So I got a bunch of games. I didn't play anything this week, but uh, um, I'm excited to play that stuff, especially Machi Koro like that. I have not found somebody in my play group that has not liked that game. So it's, even my mom, who has only played like three of my hundred some games, like Machi Koro was her jam. What else you got? <laughs> that's it oh catacombs and machi koro uh oh and i got wwe superstar showdown which isn't that exciting except i'm a big wwe fan so it is exciting you really are man i see you on twitter mm -hmm. talking all this wwe stuff and i have no idea what you're talking about well i try to hashtag it in a way where people can just mute the hashtag and not have to worry about it wait you can do that yeah yeah so i like if i'm watching raw on monday night i'll hashtag raw and so if you click on that hat if you like right click i think on well Hold on. Oh. So if you go to Twitter.com and you click on it, you can mute that hashtag. Or if you have a Twitter app, you can say mute anything that's hashtag raw. That that's just led crazy. into the next segment that I was to think we could do. Twitter tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can you can mute. On... It's a pretty good one. There you go. Now you don't have to deal with me tweeting about Monday Night Raw, which is a terrible show, but I watch it every Monday. No, I, I like seeing it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. It's like hearing about like the debates of a political party from a country I've never heard of. It's just like, I don't know. I guess that's bad. Maybe that's good. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I feel, I'm, a, I'm a bad host here. I don't know what our next topic is supposed to rotate into. 
No problem. Let's just do random conversations because let's talk about the future of the podcast. How about that? Sure. Yeah. Because here's here's what I think is going to happen. And I talked to Sean outside of here, and I think we agree that the episodes are only going to get better and better as we find our mojo and flow and as we get more and more comfortable and we become more and more of ourselves, uh, which is going to be really tough because this episode is going to be amazing. So <laughs> it's only going to get better. Uh, I do have a idea for one segment, and that is business talk. So business talk is where I guess I'm trying to imagine what do listeners, what would they actually be interested in hearing? And I think we'd get some audience members definitely interested in what the hell's going on with our very small indie business of Tuesday night games. So for that, I would actually like to ask Sean, what would you like to share of what's going on in the business right now of our company? Well, uh, it depends on like what what's on the table. Is there anything we don't want to talk about? But we're not. I guess I don't know. Um, I, I can't think of anything that we wouldn't want to talk about. We want to be as natural as possible. I guess once we start talking about stuff we shouldn't, we'll just turn to SBJ and say, "Hey, edit that out, would you?" Yeah, I suppose. So the only thing to edit so, out. So thanks for listening. That was the business <laughs> talk session. <laughs> so. Uh, Nothing you want to, we should share everything, right, Sean? Because <laughs> um, we didn't just some, edit out anything, did we? Some cool stuff that's going on right now is, uh, you know, we're talking to bigger box stores like, you know, Target.com, um, Target, Barnes & Noble, Hastings, um, and we're talking to PSI about, you know, working with them. Um, and it's just interesting, like, taking a look at all the different business models available to us, you know, Amazon only, Amazon plus distribution, Amazon plus distribution plus big box and trying to put up with a model that makes sense for us and for like what we want to get out of the company, you know? Um, so it's been sort of an interesting challenge just trying to figure out like what is going to work for our business long term, you know? Yeah. I also know you've been really busy since the product is finally out with customer service and we're trying our best to get mm -hmm. one of the best reputations for customer service. So anytime anyone post any type of issue like oh my cards are kind of spotty i try to catch them as soon as possible and say email sean at contact at tuesday night games .com with any problems that you have with the game players I know that have, yeah go on players have been interacting really well in fact today um this was nice i got an email from a guy that said like if there was such a thing as like overly customer service like he said something just super nice that was like you guys have gone insanely way above and beyond and like we're playing the game tonight and I'm so happy. Um, and we don't get that a lot, but it was definitely cool to hear because um, I think we got lucky. I don't think a lot of customer, like a lot of companies can afford to give some of the levels of customer service right now that we're doing, you know, like if your Kickstarter barely funds and you only have enough money to ship and then some guys like, Hey, my cards are miscut. You're kind of SOL. Like there's nothing you can do for that guy because there's just no money, you know? Yeah. But, but, you know, we haven't had that problem so far, which has been great. As scary as this may seem, let's talk about the dark side. What's one of the worst customer requests that you've gotten as far <laughs> as you get anyone really belligerent? Like, hey, I had to wait forever for this game and I want you to die. Nobody's, also, send me some cards. Nobody's really mean to me. Um, people might be annoyed at first, but then after I'm like, hey, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, what, you know, what's your address or, you know, what cards are, are the problem or whatever. Everybody calms down. This is funny. I had um, a girl that had volunteered for us before. I gave her some shit because she forgot to change her address after the kick and um, she forgot to change her address before the Kickstarter shipped. So the Kickstarter shipped and she emailed me and was like, hey, like, I forgot to change my address. Can you change it here? And I gave her some shit and was like, oh, come on. You're one of our volunteers. You should have known this. She's like, sorry. And I, you know, went ahead and changed her address or whatever. And then she messages me like a month later and is like, hey, did this ever get shipped to me? And so I'm going back through and I'm like, I think so, yeah. Um, let me double check. Maybe I send her another copy or something like that. And then she gets back in touch and she's like, oh, the one you're sending it to is at the, going to the wrong address again. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And um, it turns out she had sent me the wrong, or she had moved again since having sent the address. So it's just one of these <laughs> things, it's like, what am I? You're supposed to be on our side. I've just spent 60 bucks of worth of product on you, you know? I've definitely caught this as the dark side. Uh, and this is laughable. I don't want to say this keeps me awake at night at all. But an angry message 
put publicly, hey, I didn't get mine, what the heck? And then you check it out. And they just filled out their survey after everyone's already getting theirs. So people not filling out their survey is an issue with Kickstarter. Yeah. And we try our best to remind them. Yeah. I think Kickstarter is super crazy. And I, I, I've backed a lot of things on Kickstarter. I think I've hit like 100 things backed. And I've created three Kickstarters. And I remember when you guys were going through um, the Two Rooms in a Boom Kickstarter, I, there was moments of frustration on my end where I was like, I've played this game. I've seen this game. The, the game is literally cards. There are no dice. There are no spinners or tops or fancy components. Like, why is it taking so long to get shipped? And then you kind of see following. And obviously, I get that there were problems, and you guys have explained that. But it, it's funny to see that, like, people, instead of dealing with that or coming to an understanding of, like, okay, they're having problems, but, like, they gave me an update. The, the first thing they go is, like, I want my money back, even though... <laughs> And I don't know if you guys got that a lot, but like a lot of other Kickstarters, like if there's anything negative posted to their walls, it's like refund, refund. And I want to like strangle all those people and be like, Kickstarter is not a store. You are there to fund somebody's like passion and what their, their project and what they're trying.